it's time to learn how to trace C++. And to start with, because it might have been a while since the last time you had to trace code, we'll do this example that is pretty much a C tracing example with a bit of C++ flavor thrown in. So these C++ output statements and some C++ initialization statements. But really, this is the kind of example you might have seen in 111. Um, I should also apologize in advance for the sort of icky uh, representation of these output statements. I had to cram everything together by removing all the white space to make enough space on the screen. That is one advantage you will have if you're tracing code on paper is that you can probably get yourself some more paper, whereas I have to try and cram everything in. Um, in a typical exam situation, if the exam is an in-person paper exam, and who knows what'll happen, but uh, if the exam is in-person on paper, a typical question might be, here's some code, give the output. So just run the code by hand, give the output. If the exam is given online, then of course that question becomes a bit trivial because you could ask a compiler to help you. Um, and so instead the question might be something like, here's some code, run it by hand until this thing happens. So the, the first time a variable is set to a negative value, for example, then stop immediately and report things like, what was the value of the variable? Or what are all the variables in the current scope? Or what line number did you stop? But one way or another, you'll have to be able to run the code by hand to do that. And so I want to go through the process I use for that. Of course, there are lots of different ways of doing it. And in general, in a course like this, no matter what the question ends up being, the only real expectation is that you get the right answer. There's no requirement that you use my method, or nor am I representing that my method's any better than anybody else's. Uh, but it's certainly one that works for me. Uh, and in general, if you're lacking any other ideas, I would encourage that you try it. So the goal of uh, tracing code is to get the right output. And of course, the reason we like doing that, the reason it's good to learn how to do that is because it makes us better at debugging. And we should notice that there are times when we need a more rigorous visualization because the problem we're looking for seems to be very difficult and, and hard to spot. And there are times when it suffices when we're tracing code to do a broad sketch of what's happening. And you've already seen in the previous videos um, that I go back and forth and it depends on the problem. So if I'm working with a data-oriented problem with lots of vectors, I probably don't want to have to do a full scoping diagram based trace. I mean, I will if I have to, but I want to try and find some easier way of doing it first. And I encourage you to do the same thing on exams. Uh, I want to show in this video, though, the very lowest level, um, fully rigorous, uh, fully visualized uh, tracing, the same kind of thing I might have done in 111. We're going to need that on a, at a, on a couple of different occasions during this course. So I'm going to run this as if it, the question were, give the complete output of the program. So I'm going to start executing and just generate every line of output. I'm going to put that down here. Uh, and then I'm going to try and use this little quadrant of the screen to draw my diagram. OK, so I'm going to start on line number seven. I'm going to start inside of the scope of main. And so I'm going to draw a scoping box for main. Uh, and if you want more information on this format that I like using, where I, I call these things scoping boxes, you might want to take a look at some of the old 111 videos because I go over this uh, process in great detail in many of those videos. I'm not going to go through a full review of every aspect of that in this video, but I am going to use this format a few times during this course. So on line number six, I create a scoping box for main to store because I've uh, enter the scope of main when the program starts. I get inside these curly brackets for main, and that means I might have to create some variables that will be main's personal belongings, the local variables of the function main. And certainly on line seven, there they are. So I create a variable called x. x is an int. x's initial value is six. On line number eight, I create a variable y. y is also an int, and its initial value is 10. And then I print my first line of output. I print main one, then the value of x, then a space, then the value of y. So I'll just write that down here. Uh, in general, on an exam uh, with a question like this, we don't care too much about your, the spacing of your answer because, of course, how do we mark that anyway? How do we know how many spaces you put in your handwritten answer? Um, so I'm going to try and for format this in a way that lines up a little bit so that we can see the answer better when we're done. So I print out the value of x, and I print out the value of y. Uh, and then I get to line number 11. So line number 11 is an assignment statement containing a function call. There's a lot going on here. What we should remember first off, whenever we see one of these assignment statements in code that we're tracing, is to follow that first law of assignment statements. And I'm going to do that by crossing off the left-hand side. Because that way, I don't get any preconceptions about what's going to end up happening. And I don't want those. I know that the assignment will be evaluated in the computer by first doing the right-hand side and then going from there. So I need to do that. I need to do whatever is necessary to convince my brain not to jump ahead of things. Uh, OK, so I want to call this function f. And when I'm done, I'm going to replace the function call with some return value. 
that comes back from f. And that will be what I end up actually assigning to the variable y. But before I can call the function f, I have to first work out what I'm going to be passing in as its arguments. OK, so on line 11, I'm inside the scope of main. I'm inside these curly brackets. And of course, on my diagram, that puts me in this box. And so if I use a name in this context, we should recall the way that the compiler goes looking for names. So I want to compute the value x plus 1 inside this scope here. So I need the name x. So inside a, a, a given scope, if you use a name, the compiler says, OK, I'm in this scope here. Go looking for the name x and we find it it's this okay so that's the value i get for x uh, and we'll see in a minute that there's a strategy we have to use if i go looking for a name and it isn't there but in this case the name was there the, the name x refers to the number six and so i've got six plus one that's going to end up being i'll just i will jump ahead in this part and say that's going to be a seven i'm going to make a call there uh, the name y refers to ten uh, okay so i'm going to cross these out uh, and now what i have is a call to f where the arguments are seven and ten I like crossing out the actual um, expressions inside the brackets because that makes it a lot easier for me to make sure that I am not making any assumptions about f, about what f is actually getting. f is just getting two ints. Notice that these are being passed in as regular ints. I don't see any ampersands or anything. We're going to start seeing those later this week. Um, and as a result, what f is really getting is a photocopy of numbers. It's getting the number 7 and the number 10. It's not getting x and y. It has no knowledge of x and y in main. And so it's good that when I trace through this, I write in 7 and 10, and I cross out x plus 1 and y. So I don't get the impression that f can modify my originals. So I have the arguments, uh, the values of the arguments ready. So now I can actually begin setting up f on my diagram. So here's the scoping box for main. Um, and when I enter f, notice that f has curly brackets. And whenever I see code enclosed in curly brackets, I am defining a scope. Uh, and so the question should be that then be, where do I put the local variables, the possessions of f? And the rule we use in languages like C++ and C is we go looking for where the curly brackets, where the scope itself physically appears in the code. Notice that the scope for f and the scope for main are separate. f is not in, literally inside of main. I might call f inside of main, but the scope itself, the curly brackets for f, are outside of main. And that's a hint to me that when I draw a scoping box for f, the scoping box I draw should be physically outside of the scoping box for main. So I'm going to draw it out here, separate. And then I'm going to create uh, boxes on the diagram for f's two arguments, which will become regular local variables, so a and b. Once I have those two set up, I can actually begin performing the call. So on line 11, I'm passing in the value 7 is going to become a, the value 10 is going to be assigned to b. Uh, okay, so I do that, 7 into a and 10 into b, and I am following the second law of assignment statements by doing this because I crossed out x plus 1 and y and wrote in 7 and 10. That means that whatever f is getting will definitely just be a copy of whatever I passed in, which is the correct behavior. So I have that. I have the variables all set up, which means I am now ready to start executing f. So I'm going to just pause main at line 11 and then go up to line number 2 and begin executing f. So the first thing is an output statement. So I'm going to print out the value of a and b. And I'm currently in this scope. I'm inside the scope for f. So when the compiler goes looking for the name a, it'll start by looking in there and find the name a. Oh, there it is. So it uses that. So the value it prints out will be 7. So inside of f, I'm going to print 7. And then the value of b is 10. All right, so then I end up down on line 3. Now line 3, now this is interesting because line 3 contains a variable declaration with a C style initialization. And you might have heard in previous videos, I keep discouraging you from using this. I keep saying, please use the curly brackets. Don't use C style initialization. It's going to pay dividends later. And yet here I am in a tracing question doing just that. So a couple of things. One, I do reserve the right to add C style initializations to tracing questions as I see fit, because um, that's a valid feature of the language, even if it's one we should try to avoid using wherever possible. But two, the reason I added it to this example was specifically to show off there is a certain misconception that you can make when you see an assignment statement that I think is a bit more obvious when you do it in the C style initialization way um, that I want to catch right off the bat, because I want to remind ourselves we have to be vigilant about this, just like we were in one. 11. So this is saying create a new variable called x, which is of type float. So we'll just park that here. I'm still inside the scope for f, so when I create a variable called x, it gets created in this scope here. 
Uh, and uh, now I'm going to cross this off because I don't, I shouldn't care what I'm assigning my right hand side to until I have the right hand side done. And it's a very common, I think, misconception from what I've seen at least, that people say stuff like, oh, X is a float. That means I should assume whatever I'm doing on the right hand side happens in the context of real numbers. And that's not true because the first law of assignment statements tells us that we have to evaluate the right hand side completely before we care at all about where we're putting the result. So A over B. Uh, inside the scope of F, A is 7 and B is 10. So A over B would be 7 over 10. And both A and B are ints. So I've got int over int. And we should recall from 111 that int over int equals int. So 7 over 10, well, that would otherwise be 0 0.7. But the problem is that 0 0.7 can't be stored in an int. And the result of this has to be an int. And that means that the result here is just going to be 0, because we know that, the, that 0 0.7 assigned to an int becomes 0. We truncate it. And so even though, now that I have a final value on the right-hand side, I can figure out what I'm, where I'm putting it, even though x can contain 0 0.7, it never gets the chance. Because by the time that we have the division result computed, it's too late. I've already truncated it down to 0. So the value of x is going to be assigned the value 0. Uh, and you'll also notice that when I was doing that assignment statement, I added a variable called x to the scope of f. Because of course, on line 3, I'm in the scope of x. But notice that x is a name that is used elsewhere in the program. And I just went right by that, because it's no big deal. F has its own set of personal possessions. Main has its own set of personal possessions. And F has no idea what other functions, other scopes happen to own. And main has no idea what other functions own either. So in person, I usually observe, for example, that you have a wallet and I have a wallet. And if I reach into my pocket and pull out my wallet, then I'll have my credit card inside and not yours. Because we can both have possessions that happen to have the same name. And it doesn't cause us any confusion, because context resolves the difference. And the same thing is true here. And I think that the diagram helps us to see that. In the diagram, it shouldn't scare us that much that there's two things called x, because I can differentiate them based on their context. Now, it wouldn't, of course, be acceptable to have two things called x in the same context. That would make no sense, because which one do I mean when I use the name x? But if I have two things called x in the program, that's no big deal. Because if I'm in the scope for f, if I'm in this box here, and I use the name x, well, we go looking inside the box, we find this one. If I'm in the scope for main, and I use the name x, then I would find the one up here. Well, not, not that. I'd find this one. Um, and so because the contexts are different, whichever context I'm in dictates what name I find. I'm going to come back to this in a few minutes when we get down to line 14 in main. So here, we're currently done line 3, so we're now on line 4 of f. Return x. So f is about to end. And that means I have to modify my diagram, but it also means I have to make a note of the return value. So the expression x works out to the value 0. So I'm going to return 0. The way I typically keep track of this is I go back down to wherever f was called. So that would be down on line 11. And I know that when f is done, it returned the value 0. So I'm just going to replace that function call with the value 0. OK, so I've made a note of that. Uh, now f is ready to end. It's returned its value. I can now end f. So f is going to end. And whenever a scope ends, whether or not the scope is a function, all of its personal possessions get destroyed forever. They are gone. And I should make sure, because my goal with this tracing is to duplicate what the computer is doing, I should make sure that this is reflected on my diagram. So when the scope ends, its stuff is gone. And so that means that I should destroy all of it. It should be gone, because otherwise I might get confused later and think some of it still exists. And of course, for example, if there are two variables called x in the program, that could be pretty dangerous. So I make sure it's all gone. I'm never going to need it again. The computer would destroy it at this point too. And so I make sure I destroy it to avoid confusion. Um, keep in mind, in, in an exam setting, you need all the help you can get. So it's pretty common, you might recall, walking into an exam and like forgetting your own name. So you don't want a visualization technique that creates any ambiguity, that creates any possibilities for those careless errors where you use one number instead of another. Because it's easy to make those, and you still lose marks for them. If the answer is wrong, you still don't get the marks. So any visualization that helps to insulate against that possibility is a good idea. OK, so I'm now done F, and I'm back on line 11. And I, I notice that I now have the right-hand side of my assignment ready. So I'm ready to actually do the assignment. And the assignment is y equals 0. So I've just subbed in 0 for the return value of f. Uh, and so in the scope of main, so I'm back up in this scoping box here, the variable y is this thing. So I set this to be 0. And then I end up uh, on line 12, where I generate some more output. And I print out main 2. And I print out the values of x and y. 
And of course, because I've erased the scope for f, because f is over, the val it's pretty obvious what I mean by x and what I mean by y. So x is 6, y is 0. Then I get to line 14. Now, obviously, this is a contrived example. You don't usually see people writing code that looks like this. Now, strangely, it is actually quite possible for if statements that are this vacuous to show up in code as the result of certain automation that is used when compiling code, but not likely to be written by somebody deliberately. But it's fair game for a tracing question. So uh, if 0 is less than 1, OK, well, spoiler alert, 0 is less than 1. So we are going to go inside the if statement. And notice that the if statement uh, the body of the if statement has curly brackets, and that's RQ. Whenever I see code contained inside curly brackets, that is RQ that a new scope is being created. Uh, and so I'm creating a new scope. Notice that the curly brackets for the if statement, the scope for the if statement, is physically inside of main. So the curly brackets for the if statement appear inside the curly brackets for main. And again, where scopes are on our diagram, where, where they appear when the code runs, are a function of simply where are the curly brackets? Where is the scope physically located? Because the scope for the if statement is physically inside of the scope for main, I represent it as such on my scoping diagram. So I've got this. So I'll just call it if. Now, the names I put here are just for my own edification. Um, you can call them whatever you want. You might actually want to use a different, like put some dots or something to make it clear this is not a function, just a scope inside the function. You might also, if you have lots of different nested scopes, you might also want to make a note that this happened on line 14. Um, but whatever works for you. So the diagram's job is just to help you out. You can use as much or as little of this formalism as you want. Um, okay, so on line 14, I started this new scope. On line 15, I see this. This is a declaration. Under all circumstances where this code compiles, this will always create a new variable. There is no way that a statement like this will ever use an existing variable called x. It must create something new. Now, in this, I'm currently inside this scope here. There is nothing called x inside this scope. And therefore, it is valid to create, on line 15, a variable called x with an initial value of negative 111. Now, it would not be valid, so hypothetically, suppose this weren't a scope, it would not be valid to run this statement outside in this scope out here. Because if I did that, then I'm trying to define two different variables, both called x, in the same context. That makes no sense. However, because I'm inside this nested scope, online, the one I created on line 14, this is a different context. Inside the if statement and outside the if statement are different contexts. So I am allowed to put a variable called x inside this scope. It's true there is also another variable called x in main, but these are distinct because they are differentiated by their context. Um, and in general, so I'm currently inside this scope here. In general, if I use a name, the way the compiler looks for it is it says, look inside the current scope for that name. If the name is found, then use that. If the name is not found, then leave the current scope and go to the outer scope and then look for the name there. If the name still isn't found, leave that scope into the, the scope outside of it and keep going until you hit the, the global scope, this strange spooky wilderness outside of any function. Um, and if it can't find the name there, then it gives an error. But in general, if it can't find the name inside the scope you're in, it looks in the scope outside of it. OK, so line number 16. Here's an assignment statement, and therefore we should treat it like any other assignment statement. We should use the first law of assignment statements. Let's cover up the left-hand side. x minus 5. OK, so in the context, I'm actually going to, I'll just extend this out. So x minus 5 x minus 5. So in this scope here, I'm currently inside this scope, I go looking for the name x. Well, I get this. OK, so x is the value negative 111. OK, so x is negative 111. And then negative 111 minus 5, that's going to be negative 116. Oh, how convenient. Um, so that means that, this is, that the right-hand side of the assignment statement evaluates to negative 116. So I'm just going to clean that up a bit. So this whole thing is going to end up being negative 116. OK, so I'm done the right-hand side. I'm ready to uncover the left-hand side. The left-hand side is y equals. So I'm currently inside this scope here. And I'm trying to run the assignment y equals negative 116. So I go looking for the name y inside this box. Do I find it? No, I don't. So there is no name y inside this box. So I look outside. So I escape from the box. And again, I'm allowed to leave scoping boxes to go look for a name if I can't find it. I'm never allowed to go back in. So you can leave the box you're in, but you can never break into a box. You can never enter a box from the outside. So I look for the name y. I can't find it in here. I leave and I look outside in the, in the, in the enclosing scope for main. And sure enough, there is 
uh, a name Y out there. It's this thing. So when I use the name Y on line 16, I am referring to this variable here. All right, so I set that to be negative 116. There it is. And then I hit line number 17, which is, so I'm going to clean this up. I hit line 17, which is printing some more outputs. So I print out main three, and then I print out X, and then I print out Y. So on line 17, I'm still inside this scope here. I go looking for the name X, and I find this one. So I print out negative 111. And then I go looking for the name Y, and there is no name Y in here, so I have to escape from the box and look outside. Okay, so I find the name Y outside, it's negative 116. And that brings me to the end of line 17, and then I hit line 18. Line 18 is a closing curly bracket. It is the end of a scope. The if statement is about to end. And when the scope ends, all of its possessions get destroyed. They are gone, and so I should make sure that change is reflected on my diagram. So I go through and just destroy it. It is gone, because if I leave it there, then there's a chance I'll get confused about these two different variables called x. And of course, that is a nightmare. On a tracing question on an exam, if you make a mistake at step two, it's pretty likely that you, that, that same mistake propagates through the program. So it's very important that you keep things organized all the way through. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm done line 18. I destroyed my scope for my if statement. Now I get to line 19, and line 19 is just more output. Main four. Okay, so I print out x, I print out y. Well, now that I'm back in the in the primary scope for main, it's sort of obvious what x and y are going to be. x is six and y is negative 116. Uh, and then the program ends. And of course, I guess for completeness, I'm, so the program ends down here, main ends. I guess I should destroy the scope for main to be a good role model. There we go. Uh, and we'll just erase all of that stuff. Uh, okay, so the program is now over, and this is the output. Uh, and although, yes, I mean, there was work involved, I claim that if you use some organized visualization, like a diagram, like a scoping diagram, like the one I used, then you end up getting the right answer pretty reliably. As long as you know the rules, even in an exam setting where every other rule is sort of out the window, it is pretty easy to follow along. So this was an example that although it used C++, I mean, we have C++ output statements and initializations, fundamentally it was just, you know, you know, rehashing some concepts from C. Uh, in the next video, we're going to start talking about the new features that we have to trace through uh, in 116, new C++ stuff like the auto keyword.